Good morning and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today for our second in a series of five webinars. My name is Tracy Rains and I'm the Rangeland Resource Manager with the Nature Conservancy of Canada and I will be your host for today. This series of webinars are being brought to you by the Alberta Range Stewardship Course and the Southern Alberta Grazing School for Women. The Alberta Ranch Stewardship Course is a cooperative initiative of several organizations, including beef producers. It has its roots in the Stockman's Range Management Courses that were offered across Alberta in the past. The course provides an opportunity for livestock producers and professionals to come together, to share information and expertise, because both provide valuable knowledge and skills. Our goals as we share experiences and information is to keep ranching operations sustainable in Alberta economically, but also socially and environmentally. It is offered throughout Alberta and is typically a one to two day course with a combination of indoor hands-on field learning and field learning. This will be the third year the course has been offered. The Southern Alberta Grazing School for Women is an annual event that is now in its 17th year. It brings together women to network and share experiences and to develop and enhance farm and ranch management skills. The school is always partnership based and hosted each year by various counties, municipalities, government agencies and nonprofit groups from across southern Alberta. The two groups decided to team up in the time of COVID and offer these webinars instead of the usual in person workshops. So right now we just want to get an idea of who is attending today. Um, a poll should be coming up on your screen. And you can just check your response and click submit. You may have to scroll down to see the whole screen. And afterwards, you may have to close it to go back to the presentation. And I will go over a few housekeeping items while you do that. Um, for today, your mics will be muted. You can change your view by going to the top right hand corner of your screen and you can choose speaker view or gallery view and you can also size the windows. If you're having trouble hearing or other technical troubles, you can use the chat box at the bottom of your screen and we'll try to help you out. Presentations will be approximately 45 minutes long with a question period to follow. You can ask questions using the Q&A function. The icon is at the bottom of your screen. The first four sessions are being recorded. While we will officially end things at the hour mark, presenters will stay online for a bit for a discussion if anyone would like. To ask a question or bring up a topic during this time, you can raise your hand electronically. To do this on the participant icon at the bottom of your screen and use or click on the participant icon at the bottom of your screen and use the raise your hand button and ask your questions. And now we can take a look at our poll. Okay. Oh, I don't know. I've just got an error message saying failed to share poll, but hopefully you folks can see it. Uh, looks like the majority is producers, which is great. Oh, I'm getting comments that you guys can see it. Okay, great. We will continue on then. Okay. We just wanted to, before we continue, we just wanted to say a thank you to all of the organizations and people who come together to make these two events possible. It takes quite a bit to pull everything together, so. It's a good effort by folks. Okay, let's get started. Our presenter today is Noreen Ambrose. In her nearly 21 years with Cows and Fish, Noreen is focused on working with landowners, communities, and natural resource professionals to help them recognize the value of riparian areas and what they can do to maintain these areas as healthy, productive pieces of our landscape. Her work with community leaders, organizations, and agencies emphasizes sharing lessons learned in effective program design and delivery. She combines wetland ecology research with her farm upbringing to help bridge science, management, and education. She believes strongly that those who manage and use the land are critical to ensuring a healthy landscape. And I will pass it to you, Noreen. Great, thanks, Tracy. You can hear me all right? Yep, I can. Great, as soon as my um, clicker decides to advance properly, we'll be good. <laughs> it's decided to sleep. So thank you everybody for 
sorry, for joining us today. Um, it's good to have so many people in a variety of locations joining us. We have um, over 150 to 200 people registered for the series as a whole, and we know um, each one will be attended by a group of different, potentially different people, but um, hopefully if you want to review this or certainly share it with your friends afterwards, um, any of our recorded series in, in the webinars, you can, we, you can do that as well. So I'm going to talk about what are repairing, how do they work, and, and what does this thing called health, repairing health, look like? And so um, feel free to contact me or any of my colleagues, of course, after the, afterwards. So Cows and Fish is an organization that helps to foster stewardship around riparian areas and the landscape as a whole, um, with the idea being that obviously um, if we understand these places better, we can manage them more effectively and to maintain that health and productivity into the future. So we know there are a lot of uh, excellent grazing stewards in, in agriculture in Alberta and beyond. And um, we, we don't have a lot of time today. I'm not gonna talk really about the management side of grazing in riparian areas because that was more our last webinar, but I'll talk more about um, what is a riparian area and how it relates to health and function. And I'll give a few examples of management examples that have maintained or improved riparian health um, and you can refer to our prior webinar and our next one uh, more on sort of some of the grazing specifics. If you're interested in looking up some of the digital stories that we've done uh, with uh, landowners, check out our, our YouTube site that has a bunch of individual stories. So as Tracy said in my intro, we have a really um, vested interest in working with landowners. We think they're the key to managing and having healthy landscapes in Alberta. A large percentage of our land base is of course uh, managed by agricultural producers, farmers and ranchers. And so that stewardship ethic um, is about taking care of the land. And so first of it's how do we understand what the land we're on? Many of you probably know what a riparian area is, but just so we're sort of all on the same page, it's that piece of the landscape that's affected by extra water, water in a water body um, that affects the soil and creeps the vegetation uh, wet. Um, the roots are essentially reaching into that shallow groundwater or they're right adjacent to the stream or the lake or the wetland. And um, that extra abundant water, of course, makes the riparian area uh, moister than the upland um, and not quite as wet obviously as the aquatic zone right next to it and it isn't a predetermined width or size everybody says well how big is a riparian area well it depends every um, piece of uh, landscape is unique and different and so the width varies of course depending on how wide that influence zone that sort of transition between the the wet and the dry is in southern Alberta, we're in the prairies and the Great Plains, it can be next to a big river. It might be a cottonwood forest and shrub shrublands that are adjacent. It might be the cattail community or the willows next to a wetland in the boreal forest. Um, but one thing we know, it's much easier to identify in dry landscapes compared to moisture landscapes in the open prairies and the foothills. Um, it's the green place usually in August in that, um, in where everything else next to it is brown. Riparian areas do tend to be pretty messy. Um, they aren't neat and tidy. They don't always have standing water either. They might be dry um, or visibly, you know, no surface water, although the soil may still be moist. So it's important to recognize that they are highly variable places, um, but they're really important relative to their small size. In the sort of prairies and Great Plains, they make up maybe 5% of the landscape um, at most and more like 2% in many areas. So uh, they're really critical, uh, important places despite their small size. And settlement occurred mostly next to water bodies because we needed water. And um, sometimes we didn't understand how these systems work, like the fact that streams and rivers naturally move and the channel may be carving a new path. And, and sometimes we can end up in a bit of a, a wreck or a challenge um, by being too close to them because we didn't recognize these places move. We also have relatively short memories and we have relatively short lifespans on the big scheme of things and don't recognize that the landscape has changed a lot in sort of the primary settlement period. Um, this is a shot from central Alberta um, along the Battle River. You can see how wooded um, the river valley is um, under the train bridge in the 1920s compared to the present day. Uh, most of those uh, trees, that forest has gone missing. 
And so with our land management practices certainly have changed um, what the landscape looks like. Here's another example uh, in the southern foothills of Alberta, in the edge of the prairies along Willow Creek, which the current present day 1995 comparison shot shows there's not many willows left in what was um, a very willow dense little valley. And so grazing as part of our landscape has been part of our landscape both before settlement with bison but also um, with cows and horses and sheep today and both of these pictures show you a graze site um, it's just about how we manage our grazing that's important and um, you can see without any specific training or tools that these sites are very different but this is actually the same stream less than 100 yards apart um, and the grazing management is very different one piece is um, on the right is showing you a lot of unraveling um, and clearly not a very healthy looking site um, compared to that one on the left. And again, both having grazing. It's that deep binding roots, that natural rebar that holds the place together. That's so important in our stream and river systems as well as on our lake shores and wetlands where the water, it's more wind action um, and there's still a need for um, adequate deep uh, rooted vegetation around our shorelines. Even if that isn't really obvious, the wave action around lakes um, and larger wetlands um, is really important for protecting the soil on the edges. And that uh, vegetation around our streams and our rivers especially causes what we create good mud. It's the trapping, it's the physical thing that holds on to, slows down the water and um, allows all those sediment particles to be trapped on land and pulled out of our waterways. So that good mud is what builds our rich soils in our valley bottoms. And it's what helps heal and regrow and um, build new, um, new opportunities for the floodplain to fill back in after a large flood event and erosion. So the plants do a few things. They not only create that physical barrier and holding onto material, but they also take up nutrients and modify those nutrients um, into other forms. So helping clean our water. Of course, most people think probably this is the number one uh, thing that people think about when they think about water quality or value of riparian areas. Um, and so water quality is really important. But so are other things. Um, so is having the structural integrity and the right kind of form or shape for riparian areas. When we have a healthy riparian area, we have lots of natural meanders in streams and rivers. Uh, the water is going slower. It can't go in zigzags and meanders as quick as it can in a straight line. And um, if we take out those meanders and take out that vegetation and friction, um, it races. If you double the speed, it can do four times as much work and carry 64 times as much material, which is why uh, streams that are channelized um, are faster and produce more erosion. Um, just like that, that's why we build our canals in irrigation systems comparatively straighter. We, we, they're water conveyance systems, but our natural systems, we don't actually want to have increased energy and erosion. We do want the water to slow down and have the opportunity to soak in, whether it's runoff from the hillsides or the neighboring area, um, or it's flood water from a high water event in a lake, a wetland, or a stream or river. We want that opportunity to soak in to the groundwater. Uh, on the left, you see that happening. On the right, not so much because you have very limited vegetation and less opportunity. In the spring or in high water events, um, at the top of the photo here, you see water seeping in, having that opportunity. And then in the fall, when the trees are yellow at the bottom of the picture, they have that opportunity to for all that water that was stored in the shallow aquifer, the shallow groundwater, to move back in to the water body. And if we don't store it, it doesn't have that opportunity to come back in. And so especially across the Great Plains and the prairies, um, when we have water that's quite limiting, we need water flowing year round. When it's frozen in the winter, that water that's been stored is really important to come back into our water bodies. We also think about this often only in streams or rivers, but wetlands are, and lakes are contributing to this storage and slowing and reducing of flood impacts as well. And so if you think about every little wetland as a bathtub that holds a bit of water and slows it down a little bit before it gets to an end destination, um, it's really important to reduce peak flows. And um, the more we remove these cumulative small spaces, the more flooding that we have. 
probably most of you on this call are interested in grazing. That's why you're on this call, on this webinar. And we know that riparian areas are extremely productive places for forage, two to five times, even up to 10 times the productivity of surrounding uplands because they have that deep, rich soil with extra moisture. So um, taking care of them in a, as a grazing resource is really important to ensure that we have that productivity and health into the future. That productivity is also about lots of habitat for fish and wildlife. Uh, in Alberta, at least um, about 80% of our fish and wildlife populations rely on this 2% of the landscape for all or part of their life cycle. So a really important uh, piece of landscape for biological diversity. So those are kind of the how do riparian areas work in a, in a quick summary. So if you think about those functions, we're trying to trap and store sediment to to build that good mud. We're trying to recharge the aquifer. We're trying to reduce and store energy. Um, these functions um, happen based on how we manage or use the landscape. And so what I want to talk about next is what does that look like? We can't easily measure these things, but how do we um, measure or look for the right kinds of things, even if we can't easily measure sediment being stored or recharging groundwater? So why would you look at repairing health? Well, you want to understand how they work better. You want to possibly work more effectively with others and have a common language, identify challenges that might influence management, and identify those good news stories that we can learn from. Lots of the work that we've done is about working with landowners who um, have done great stuff for uh, management and we've learned their techniques and shared them with others so that um, that learning can continue. So there's multiple different ways of looking at riparian areas for different kinds of water bodies, streams and small rivers, lakes and wetlands. Uh, there's a different one for large rivers, which I'm not going to touch on so much today because some of that's not just a hands-on on-site assessment. Um, but if you are interested, you can uh, request uh, copies. And um, we are working on developing a riparian health assessment app, um, which isn't going to be done immediately but it is in the works so those of you that are interested I definitely um, encourage you to contact us um, if you'd like to be maybe in beta testing or if you know other folks are working on something similar we'd love to collaborate as well. So when we look at repairing health we look at vegetation and the physical or hyd and hydrologic type of characteristics and then sum it all up. Um, I won't go through all the nitty gritty details because there are lots of additional pieces of information but I'll give you a high level um, sort of picture view of what kinds of things do we look at? Well, the first is pick your repairing area. So usually you need to delineate the extent of it, how wide is it, but you also um, pick one management unit or a portion of a management unit that you're interested in. And then you um, recognize that repairing areas do move. Sometimes there's one piece of one repairing area, like in this photo, running into another. So the old oxbow um, and the current channel. So deciding, you know, what portion of the landscape you're interested in understanding the health um, and sometimes you say well where where's the edge is it where the flood gets to well again you're going to look for those clues of vegetation change topographic change sometimes floods but if it's a one in a hundred or one in two hundred year flood uh, maybe that's not the regular you know area that's affected by water you have to use um, those kinds of clues um, and also recognize that repairing areas that are dry or drying up still have repairing areas it's just that more of the soil may be exposed or the bed or the shore might be visible and also recognizing when we're picking sites that our historic choices of management and fencing might influence what we think is happening clearly there's no um, soil or moisture change that's matching that fence line that's just a management change in this case i believe a hay field so um, use you know a variety of clues to pick your site and once you've got your site, the first question is relatively simple. Um, and each of these is scored with a certain uh, number. And I've, this is the first slide I've just showed you that there's a number of choices, um, which have more details in our field workbooks um, of how much of the site is covered by plants. Um, and so you give it a score based on what percentage of your whole site. Obviously this photo might be only a portion of the site you wanted to look at. It might be that there's not vegetation everywhere. Maybe there's been a recent flood event and there's a bunch of sediment deposited. So that area is susceptible. Um, it might be that that is susceptible to things like weeds. I'm sure many of you have heard this joke, you know, nature abhors a vacuum. Well, what goes into those holes that are, fit, that are in nature and usually that's weeds. So we want to look at uh, things like the distribution and the canopy. the siloxide daisy, um, 
the toad flaxes, uh, all kinds of things. There's a common list we use, which includes many more than these. And we again score them based on um, some additional parameters. And why do we care? Well, obviously weeds pose a problem and in displace native species. They influence forage. They don't generally have deep binding roots like the native species we would expect to. Um, and they influence what we're gonna do for management. How are we gonna control them if, if we're able to? And then we end up with a bunch of other kinds of plants, sometimes on sites, that um, are tending to increase with the disturbance. So you have um, things like your um, tame grasses, things like brome in the top right, or Kentucky bluegrass on, grass on the left, crested wheatgrass. You have kind of annual weeds like flixweed, pigweed, chickweed, all those common kind of garden and corral or sometimes crop weeds. Um, that tend to increase with opportunity, right? More disturbance, they tend to do better. Um, and they're not as tolerant, or they're more tolerant, pardon me, is, than most of the native species. We do include a few native species in this group, like foxtail barley, which is in the bottom, and um, what's called silverweed, uh, potentilla relative, which is in the top middle there, uh, because they also increase with disturbance. And if you have a lot of this group of species covering your site, they're not deep rooted, um, and they are a concern. And this is an example where a site is Kentucky bluegrass and clover and dandelion. Um, you think about the functions I talked about, it's not able to trap sediment very well. It's um, not going to withstand a flood event. It doesn't have those um, structural pieces that would be needed. Um, and it's low, low growing, obviously. <clears throat> the next sort of questions are more based on the woody, woody plants, trees and shrubs. So does the site have the potential for preferred weed, trees and shrubs? If you have really saline or alkali soils, maybe not. Um, and really small, dry, ephemeral creeks sometimes don't support them. But for the most part, most of our riparian areas support some woody plants. And, um, and the ones that we uh, exclude from this question are things that are not really an issue that preserving themselves and maintaining themselves and that's things like buckbrush or snowberry on the left, wild rose, um, and a host of other species that are quite tolerant of grazing and disturbance um, and generally aren't an issue. What we're looking at are the other kinds of species, things like uh, willows, saskatoons, uh, aspen and cottonwood forests or spruce in spruce forests. Um, do, they, um, do they exist on the site and have, are they regenerating? Do we have seedlings and saplings um, or maybe we don't have seedlings and sapling. Have we got enough of the plant community young that it can regenerate itself? Have we got the babies coming in to replace the old stuff? If we have only um, old stuff left, that can be an issue obviously because we're not creating a continuity that we need as, as old trees or shrubs die, you need um, a variety of age classes to replace them. We also want to know usually that we've got trees and shrubs, but on smaller systems, maybe it's native deep binding rooted plants. The rebar, the stuff that holds the banks and the shore together, um, have we got the right kind of species to do that for the size of the system? Um, if we don't, the pictures on the right are a good example of what can happen. You have migrating sod clumps of thistles falling into the water, or you have peeling sod um, because it's too shallow rooted um, next to the stream. So we want to have good deep binding roots um, to hold the system together. And many people might um, have riprap, especially near uh, man-made structures like roads and culverts or bridges. But riprap, of course, doesn't count as deep binding roots. It hopefully is preventing the erosion you're worried about. But um, natural systems um, have an extremely um, strong ability to provide the same kind of protection and, of course, a lot more benefits um, than just riprap provides by itself. Often we're providing or putting riprap in places where we've got bare ground or lack of deep binding roots. And one of the other questions we asked is, is there human caused bare ground? And, and cattle are a human um, agent, um, just like vehicles are part of our, con under our control. So have we got a lot of bare ground that we're seeing on a site? Um, again, not performing those functions we'd expect. Sometimes the alterations that people cause or our cattle and li other livestock might cause are on the bank. Um, and are we seeing those? And what's the percentage of the site that has those? Um, most of the shots I'm showing today, by the way, are almost all gray situations, except in the obvious recreation site examples and things like that. So even if there's not cows in the picture, um, I've tried to select examples that are from livestock grazing situations. We want to know what's on the bank, but we also want to know what's further back. Again, have we got bare ground um, and physical alterations? Have we changed the contour, compacted the soils, changed the site profile due to our activities? 
uh, sometimes that starts at the bank and of course goes back from the bank. Um, and you can see in this situation again, um, that we're looking at you know, really impaired site that isn't going to be able to provide those functions that we would expect compared to the um, far side of the fence in the bottom shot where there's uh, a lot more uh, natural vegetation and an opportunity to provide those functions. When we're on a lake or wetland, we don't separate the banks from the rest of the site. We just look at the whole site. And again, it's very much about um, compaction of soils. Do Have we squeezed the sponge? Um, or are we allowing that sponge to fill with water and have that extra moisture storage opportunity? Um, at the top right photo shows a uh, what we call pugging and hummocking. So the hoof action over long periods of time causes raised mounds of soil um, with low spots in between and, and that's due to compaction. Uh, cultivation of course in this situation is a recreational cultivation but it could be agricultural cultivation as well. And we want to know, does the stream get out of the floodplain? I, I talked about streams flooding naturally and moving. Uh, part of that is the release valve, the opportunity for that energy and all that extra water to not stay in the channel and create a, a huge gully or canyon uh, by eroding the bottom. Instead, we want it to be able to get out and spread across the floodplain because that's that's the natural release valve that we would expect. So um, can it do that? And if it can't, have we got an incised or downcut system where it can't get up and out? Um, if you look at the top photo, that little creek um, doesn't have to add too much water and it starts to spread into the grasses and the vegetation beside it compared to the bottom photo, um, which is uh, cut down. The bottom of the channel actually eroded away after a flood event. There was a undersized culvert um, and a lot of horsepower coming through during a flood event. And so that small stream um, has great difficulty when it's normally flowing then, or even in a new future flood events to get up and out. And that causes the drying out of that riparian area. So that's something we, we don't wanna see obviously. We also, if we're looking at lakes and wetlands and large rivers, uh, wanna look at water level change. You know, have we drained the, drained the water body? Have we um, taken the water out for other purposes? Have we left enough water in the system um, for that repairing area to, to do its natural things? And you put all of those things together. Um, we do a, a more complex version than I've covered in a few minutes, obviously with lots of additional details um, on plant species and things, but you put all those things together doing a health assessment and you come up with a score and um, each of the questions has um, a possible score and once you add them all up you give it a percentage and if you score under 60 percent it's considered unhealthy meaning most of those functions that I talked about are impaired as compared to if you're between 60 and 79 percent that means that you are actually healthy but with some problems so there's some things that are impaired or maybe not working as well as they could and cause for concern. Maybe you want to think about what might I do differently. Um, if you score over 80%, that means that basically the site is um, performing all those functions well um, and whatever you're doing already is probably a great, um, a great management uh, strategy. So um, again, kind of, are you at a red light? You just need to stop and think, what, what are the concerns I have? Are you at a cautionary situation, say, or are there some things I want to Think about tweaking or adjusting um, or am I I've got a green light go ahead lots of great things happening here continue uh, continuing all those good things whatever that management or land use might be and we you know in addition to understanding how this is relevant for grazing management it's relevant for other things too some of you um, may really be you know into fishing and angling and recognizing that these functions and functioning or repairing areas contribute to not just grazing, they contribute to fish and wildlife and water quality. And so we were part of a project a number of years ago um, where we looked um, at the health of a number of sites, of small streams in Southwest Alberta um, and related the health to the, the fish populations that some um, folks from um, Alberta Environment Parks, uh, Fish and Wildlife and Alberta, a Alberta's ACA program, Alberta Conservation Association had done fish sampling and we tied the two together and, and sites that are healthier clearly have more sport fish 
um, than those that don't. So the red bar being unhealthy, the green bar being healthy. When you look at all fish combined, it's not as obvious because things like minnows and suckers um, are very tolerant of a wide variety of different kinds of conditions. But our sport fish, uh, things like trout, are not as tolerant of less healthy conditions. And so um, to keep that mix of species, we do need to, um, to think about the land management, not just what's in the water. Similarly, we've done work with breeding birds for and forage production and in general healthier sites have more trees and shrubs, they have more breeding birds um, and uh, taller vegetation, which, which makes sense obviously. Um, and it's about tying the sort of grazing management principles, which Ross talked about last week in the webinar, the four principles apply in riparian, just like they do in upland, having balance, forage supply versus how many cows you have and how much you're taking good distribution, whether that's even or really planned and careful distribution to not allow cattle to spend all their time in their favorite spots, which tends to be near water if they get the opportunity. Looking at timing and avoiding sensitive periods. So in riparian areas, when the soils are soft and wet in the spring or after high water events, they're much more compactable. Um, and they also tend to be more susceptible in the fall or winter when the forage base, the grass has um, become less palatable or maybe there's less of it left um, and they tend to seek out trees and shrubs which is hard on trees and shrubs because unlike grass they don't grow from the bottom every year and it's also pro about providing good rest um, rest that allows the plants to recuperate before the next grazing cycle um, so just like in an upland those same things apply but there's some slightly different sensitivities in a riparian area when we put all those four principles in play we provide the same kinds of things that other parts of ecosystem need things like what fish need reducing the sediment providing cover shade and shelter and providing adequate water for fish those those things mesh together really well so i want to talk about a few examples that um, we've been involved in um, with some agricultural producers over the years just a few different um, types of uh, examples. This is in the northern part of the parkland, sort of the transition between prairie and boreal forest in Alberta. This was a wetland site that um, you can see on the top photo in 2010. Um, we did a repair and health, uh, health inventory, which is a more detailed version, and it scored 70%. Uh, so it was healthy, but with some problems. It was a site that was adjacent to a crop field. It was um, typically grazed after the crop was harvested, and then there was also winter feeding uh, adjacent to the wetland. And um, what they did, obviously, at that point is then they, they said, well, hey, we, we want it to be healthier. We're looking actually to change things. And they um, have given it six seasons of rest um, and basically quit feeding there in the wintertime. They actually ended up um, giving it complete rest. They have planned and maybe still will go back to grazing it, but they've given it many years of rest. And you can see the 2015 photo, um, the remarkable change um, in that same site. You can see the, the same trees in, in the background, um, how a few years of rest um, can, can remarkably change a site. These places are very resilient and because they have more water than the rest of the landscape, they also um, sometimes can respond really quite quickly. This is a situation um, in 2000 was the first uh, photo there you can see in the top left where a site we looked at with uh, some ranchers in the southern foothills of Alberta um, scored unhealthy and um, it's a very kind of mobile gravelly based system with uh, cottonwood forests around but a relatively dry landscape. Um, they had um, been grazing it um, late season and into the winter um, and in 2004 they um, changed that practice they quit winter grazing um, and were grazing um, more sort of spring summer um, and over time they also have reduced the total number of, of head using the site so you can see the transition from 2000 to 2007 where it's improved considerably there's lots of regeneration and less bare ground um, and by 2011, um, it had improved um, to 82% to healthy from all the way from an unhealthy situation. So all those pieces are coming back and it's still a gray site, but they changed um, the, the things that they were looking at. They were concerned and recognized that they were missing that understory of trees and shrubs because of winter use. The cows were targeting it and hanging out and lingering in these areas for cover. So um, some, some real big changes with a gray site. Another situation, uh, same kind of uh, landscape, same kind of area, started in 2000 at 62%, uh, so just into that healthy but with problems. So had some challenges with 
maybe a bit too much browse, um, some bare ground, still missing some of the tree and shrubber, shrubbery. Um, and by tw 2007, you can see it had improved. Um, and um, one of their issues, it didn't change much from 2007 to 2011. Uh, they we're using it as spring grazing, kind of in that end of winter, beginning of cal calving season. And, um, and so they switched to later use, which really gave the trees and shrubs that opportunity to come back because there's not much forage growing, obviously, in March and May in Alberta. It's pretty much cold still and sometimes lots of snow. So, um, but they kind of plateaued. Um, one of the challenges that this site has is um, wildlife browse, as well as a lot of challenges with weeds in some of these areas, which is an ongoing battle. So um, they still are quite healthy overall, 74, 73%, so healthy, but with some problems. So they've made considerable improvements, but um, some things take um, a long time to change and, are, you know, like weeds are an ongoing challenge. And uh, most of these areas have been grazed for over 100 years. So if you think about um, making changes in five to 10 years, that's actually a, quite a, an impressive improvement. And when we look at our management, it's also important to think about um, not say putting up a fence to solve our problem. This is a, a classic example of um, not applying the four principles of grazing, that the just appropriate stocking or you know the right balance for how much you're taking. Um, uh, the fence here is just a barbed wire fence. It's not filtering and trapping any sediment. Having extensive heavy grazing on the left side of the fence is not really addressed by the tiny strip of mostly weeds that are growing in that narrow bit of bank. The bank is still going to carve away at that and eventually carve away at the fence. Um, instead, it would be better to think about this as an opportunity to improve the management and the productivity of this site so it's healthier both from a forage productivity perspective, but also, of course, for riparian uh, water quality, water quantity, all those great things that a productive, healthy site provides that, that a site like this isn't really providing. So like that fence, it's not about you should do this. It's more about think about this. What are the management practices that could bring back those parameters of health? Does it have deep binding roots? Does it have uh, regeneration of trees and shrubs, assuming it supports trees and shrubs in that area? Does it have that diversity of vegetation covering the, the, the ground? Or are there weed issues? Are there a lot of physical impacts? Um, how do we how do we change or maintain our practices to keep a healthy site or, or bring it back if it's missing some of those aspects? So this shot is an example of a, a watering system. Um, and a lot of times we think just like a fence might be a solution, um, a, a watering system is a solution because cows generally, even in an unfenced situation, will spend 80% of their time drinking out of a, a trough or provided water rather than going to the same water source um, you know, a stream or a lake or a wetland, lots of research has shown that. But if we place the water trough right in the riparian area, or in this case, the small coulee draw, which is a, an ephemeral stream system, then we're targeting all that distribution into that place. We're actually encouraging them to spend more time in that place, as opposed to using the watering trough as a great distribution tool, getting the cows to spend more time elsewhere. Um, so, so it's not just use a watering trough or use a fence as management tools. They can be useful, but it's how we apply them that's so important. But what, what are we trying to achieve by providing those uh, different kinds of techniques? Um, so um, are you trying to create a functional repairing area? Are you implementing the management practices of rest, balance, timing, and distribution? And, and simply having too many cows or other livestock for too long, um, it doesn't really matter if you don't do the other things right, you still have too much forage being taken and not that opportunity for um, plant health. So here's a, a simple basic uh, solution that one rancher we've worked with for many years, a long time ago, implemented a, a, a gravity system up on a, on a spring was developed upslope from this spot and the tire trough was put sort of on the fence line so that it was accessible to multiple pastures and the small riparian area it's just a teeny little stream is downslope from him or you see that single willow behind him there's just a little um, little creek that flows and finding practical solutions that are um, again providing those kind of principles in is really important so practical has to actually work obviously um, and it has to meet the situation 
here's an example of a producer we worked have worked with in the bore, edge of the boreal forest who had these amazingly abundant lush wetlands ringed with um, willows and aspen uh, poplars and um, he wanted to graze them and he's like but i don't want to cause them to be all compacted and bare soil so he started grazing in the winter and looked at the uh, he did some forage testing to make sure the sedges that's the slough grass you might call it it's a type of grass like plant that they're standing in is um had the, had the adequate nutrition which it did um, but he did have to really watch the cows started to seek all the willows because it even without leaves willows in the winter have uh, really high nutritional value and, and cows seem to know these things and so um, you know he had to really be cognizant of that management use um, he was minimizing the physical impacts because of the frozen ground um, but he had to kind of keep on top of the other things as well so those opportunities are provided by producers doing great stuff and and i want to thank our funders of course which includes um, the, a funding we grant we have through the Canadian Agricultural Partnership, which is administered by Alberta Agriculture and Forestry, um, our support from Alberta beef producers, and um, our, our overall members and supporters. So those opportunities are provided by the support we get and for the, by the great producers that we work with, um, sharing their stories and their examples that we can learn from. So what I, I encourage you to feel free to contact me. Um, for those of you in Alberta, we have staff in other locations um, besides myself. So check out our website under contacts to find out more. And um, as Tracy said at the beginning, this webinar is going to be recorded. And so all of the um, all of the content here will be available for you um, once we send it out to you as well, if you want to rewatch it or share it with your uh, friends and family. So I'm going to uh, turn it over to Tracy to um, see what questions have been popping up. I assume there have been. I, I can't see them as a presenter while I'm presenting. So uh, over to you, Tracy. Okay, thanks, Doreen. Lots of good information. Um, before we go to questions, uh, we just got another quick poll for folks to fill out. Uh, should pop up on your screen now. You can check your hand answers, hit submit, and we'll have a look after our questions. And just a reminder, if you do have a question, you can ask it by using the Q&A at the bottom of your screen and type it in. And now we will have a look and see if we have any questions. And um, Tra while we're waiting for this, Tracy, just for, for yeah. those that, that um, are, are listening and watching, obviously, um, these polls are um, important for us to understand our impact. We all rely on a variety of funding sources and partnerships. And so it's really valuable to get your feedback both today, but also at the end. So thank you guys for filling them out. Anybody have a question out there? I am not seeing any at the moment. So we can have a look at our poll and then if folks want to answer or ask a question. Uh, okay, I will end polling. Will today's webinar influence your management practices or your work related to this topic? 49% we had a yes and 20% maybe and not applicable for 32 percent and did you learn something new today 93 percent had a yes that's great okay we've got some questions coming in okay first one thank you for the great overview do you present similar education programs geared to farming communities farming is more destructive to riparian <laughs> Sure, yeah, so we, we do work with um, cropping as well as grazing agricultural producers for sure. Uh, certainly in Alberta, many of those folks that have cows also, or other livestock also have crops of various kinds, um, whether it's forage or annual crops, you know, grain and oil seeds. So we do present to them. Um, I will say that that's not as a significant a chunk of our audience if they're just primarily only doing cropping. Um, just because I think it's harder for the folks with crops to see that um, that fit. Um, certainly, if you're cultivating a riparian area, it's not healthy. Um, like I'm not, I can't sugarcoat that. If you're turning it into canola or barley, um, it's not healthy. But what we try to do is encourage producers with crops to think about leaving a, a wider chunk of the riparian area intact or returning it to perennial forages and native species. Um, 
because um, you know if you're if you're cropping right up to say a stream or a river your soil starts to wash away you start to lose your fields um, because you're you know you're missing that deep binding roots to hold the place together um, so we definitely encourage um, those people that are farming um, practices to to look at again leaving the riparian area uncultivated or returning it to something that's got uh, more perennial cover uh, to an and it might be that they're haying it or grazing it then um, or uh, to, to gain keep it intact. Ideally you want to leave the riparian area uncultivated and, and a buffer because the other thing that happens in crop systems of course is the inputs which is often fertilizers or pesticides or herbicides which can get into the riparian area which then may also get into the waterway so obviously staying back as far as possible is um, is important to you know for those reasons in addition to sort of repairing health reasons so um, we basically go where we're invited um, so we work with producers and community groups and watershed stewardship groups that ask us to work with them um, and um, and and so depending on that makeup of people that that's sort of the folks that we primarily work with all right, thanks, Noreen. Can you help regenerate by cutting willow and planting them in the stream bank? Yeah, great, great question. Lots of people um, have cottoned on to that. Um, willows have the ability to root, as do some of the cottonwoods, actually, and things like red or dogwood. So you can definitely um, cut them. Um, we kind of have called the rule of thumb. Some uh, Dave Polster, who's a great bioengineer, uh, says you you know you want them at ideally kind of like an inch long or sorry pardon me an inch in diameter um, you genuinely want to cut them when they are dormant so early spring or late into the fall when the leaves have dropped and plant them at that same time um, and um, make sure they're in tapping into that moisture though they have to be getting enough water obviously if you can water them they'll grow better um, so but you can definitely actually um, use live material um, for sure um, and get things regrowing think about compaction though if the site's highly compacted um, it's very hard for those um, those willow cuttings to get going um, you can obviously use rooted stock as well and things like that if you <clears throat> have are so inclined to dig holes and, and you know or potted plants but um, the key thing is to address the cause of the problem um, how did you get to the point that there's a lack of willows for instance before you um, decide to put them in because because if you're not going to protect them from grazing and browsing wildlife too are going to of course like to eat them while they're fresh and young so you want to think about those kinds of things um, before you put the energy into doing that okay next question when your channel starts to get incised and continues to cut down deep is there anything we can do to prevent it from continuing to cut and even repair it to the point where it will breach the bank as it should yeah good question so um one of the things that I would say, um, I mean, it's, it's trying to understand how come it's cutting down. So is it that that site is getting a lot of water really fast? Uh, is the runoff from the adjoining watershed, the nearby area uh, coming in due to land clearing? Maybe it was forest and it's cleared or a lot of bare ground or roads diversions or culverts, things that are causing a lot of water to get there. So again, kind of looking at what's, why is it doing this? Is it, is it long-term uh, grazing or other land use that's caused the loss of the deep rooted vegetation and the site's just susceptible. Um, you know, looking, looking at why and trying to address that, obviously, if you can. Certainly getting it to rebuild over time. Sometimes it has to get worse before it gets better, meaning it does more erosion sideways. That's how it gets back in balance. So if it's already cut a long ways down, it has to start cutting sideways and creating a new floodplain at a lower level down in that cut. Um, and then that gives it that opportunity to move back and forth, trap some sediment, willows or other things start to grow and sort of start to capture stuff. And as they capture stuff over time, they rebuild. Uh, there is some interesting work in um, some, uh, mostly in the Southern US in New Mexico and other places they're doing um, uh, some re, uh, really sort of intense involved sort of land, I want to say landscaping, but erosion control techniques that we're just starting to apply a few projects here in Alberta um, that look at how to capture the runoff in the soil and sort of use that to build things up quicker. There's a couple projects including in the Grand Prairie area so in northern uh, northern Alberta um, and one in the south where we're trying these techniques out but if you're of course working in a water body there's lots of um, approvals you need to think about federally and provincially because you're in a, in a water, water body before you could do that. 
All right. Are there provincial grants available to ranchers to disperse water drops? Yeah. So in Alberta and actually across many other provinces right now, there's the CAP program, which is the Canadian Agricultural Partnership. So it's mm -hmm. a, a combination um, of the province working, the agricultural department in the province working with the federal government, um, a cost share program for riparian stewardship. So water and troughs are part of that. There's, there's a sort of a farm water supply which is trying to create more steady consistent secure supply and there's also a stewardship component so um, there are opportunities there um, as well as um, right now cows and fish has some uh, particular funding grants that are allowing us to do that as well and some of the partners um, on our committee as well so so you can certainly reach out um, I don't I don't want to necessarily say all of you call me um, but um, certainly producers in Alberta can apply and if you have something um, if you're a producer in Alberta you can give give us a call or contact one of our local um, contacts on our website as well all right is there any way to create encourage cattle crossings through management our stream is very hard to cross because most entry exit points are not aligned most times we use bridges but I would like to have one or two good stable crossings if we could develop them and they're on dog pound creek right so um the it, it, i guess it was hard the the reason that cows pick spots obviously is because they like the slope and the access point and it's usually better footing um if you're going to and, and bridges are a great option by the way for crossing to just to have control again over that trampling and that targeting and, and create secure, safe footing. Um, so one of the things in Alberta is there's growing um, expectation of, you know, of, of not targeting intense crossings. The um, Alberta Agriculture and Forestry did put out a, a fact sheet, which we helped write last, uh, last year or the year before. Um, which actually had some details on some of the regulatory considerations you need to can look at if you're trying to build a hardened footing uh, crossing that um, because you're working in a water body again you need to um, have approvals and permits so there are getting to be some more standards some of the other provinces are ahead of us in that that they already have um, different kinds of protocols in place but there's um, there's getting to be some opportunity in Alberta to to implement those um, I guess as long as you you have to obviously follow the the approvals rules if you're going to put material in a water body and that's one of the challenges if you put say gravels and stuff into a stream assuming you have approval to do so um, it does tend to wash away so you have to kind of understand the system and uh, not um, not put material there that's not actually going to stick around and be helpful in the task you've assigned it which is giving good footing so um, so it's definitely a, a bit of a challenge to build a good crossing I would say um, certainly where bridges are possible good option some of the smaller sites we're seeing producers try or ephemeral systems that aren't don't have a ton of flow things like uh, those heavy duty uh, rubber rig mats used rig mats because they don't they can't be washed away easily in a small system and they're um, very durable um, and of course they can't be eroded because they're a flat you know object unlike uh, gravel or sand you might be inclined to want to use so hopefully that answers that holly hey noreen could you maybe put your slide up with your contact info again mm -hmm. we just have someone ask for that and also what does rip rock consist of yeah so actually it's it's rip wrap so r-i-p-r-a-p so basically big boulders generally is what um in uh it, it's used for erosion control on streams um sometimes on lakeshores but basically it's big rock that's um, put in to reduce erosion um, of banks or shores um so uh again if you're actually looking at doing that because it's in the water body or the edge of the water body on the bank you need approval it's most often done not by individual landowners and more, you know, on roads, bridges, um, infrastructure protection, that kind of thing. All right. Uh, comment. Thanks so much for the info. Can you briefly describe some of the poisonous weeds that they may inhabit, that may inhabit riparian areas? Sure. So water hemlock. Yeah, water hemlock is definitely one of those. Um, I definitely, one of the things that I really wish we could be in the field doing actual plant ID and, and hopefully we, we are going to do some later in the summer still, some for those of you locally, lo some of you located locally to where we might do a field, they hope we'll get to see some of you. But um, knowing your plants is pretty important for poisonous plants as well as even just good forage and appropriate grazing timing because native plants versus some of our tame forages have different needs or 
preferences to when they're best grazed. So water hemlock, um, with, with, I don't have time to pull a picture up for you, I'm sorry. Uh, certainly I would check out our, our repair and plant book, um, which has the comparison of water hemlock to water parsnip. They look very similar. So they are in the carrot family, um, um, have this multi-divided leaves, um, but water hemlock has the veins a little different and the branching different. Um, it is extremely poisonous to humans or to livestock. Um, generally not an issue if you have a good amount of forage because there's, again, there's lots of other stuff to eat, but they can accidentally eat it. Um, and if there's not a lot of forage or if they've, if it's an overgraze situation, they might be more inclined to eat it. Um, in some of the drier portions, some parts of the province, you might have Larkspur, uh, which has a purple flower. Um, certainly um, some of the places uh, we've seen more in the central part of the province, but other places you might have seaside arrowgrass, which looks like a really skinny, skinny stem. That's actually the flower stalk and the leaf are kind of looks like a bulrush almost. The, the stem is so narrow um, and the flower is actually, if some of you know plantain, has a like little tiny balls of flower, so a vertical stem. It's not as poisonous as something like water hemlock, but if you um, run across it, it's usually in a wetlands that have more salinity um, and it's by volume. So if they eat a lot of it, again, usually early season when there's not a lot of other things to eat and there's a lot of it, um, you want to try to maybe not use those pastures at that timing because you don't want to be out there when there's a lot of it because it, it, it's a salt accumulator. Um, they may, you know, maybe seeking it out even to just for the mineral um, because obviously it's not that it tastes bad necessarily. It's just that it's bad for them. So those are a couple of common ones. Things like uh, tansy, um, are, you know, an issue generally, you know, yellow button like flowers, um, maybe not going to seek them out, but they can eat them. And then there's some abortion in impacts that it can cause um, in livestock, particularly cattle. Not sure if it's the same for sheep and goats. Um, things like some of the less palatable ones that cause blistering are not outright poison. Things like leafy spurge and tall buttercup, um, but sheep and goats might do fine on those as opposed to cows. Um, and horses. Um, so those are some of the common ones. Um, definitely plant, uh, knowing your weeds is, is useful. Avoiding those areas if you have a lot of them in a certain timing when they're as abundant is probably one of the best ways or making sure you have lots of other abundant forage, putting them out too early when the other grasses haven't greened up much or keeping them in a site too long uh, means they're going to have higher risk of eating those things if, um, if they are there. So those are, that's just sort of a general. Um, avoidance technique, I guess. All right. Uh, will climate change affect riparian health management? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I guess I would say the expectation in our part of the world, our part of the continent, is that we are going to see flooding and melt earlier and through maybe even through the winters or like starting earlier. So that might influence when sites are susceptible. Uh, not and, and when they're suitable or not suitable for grazing because water and soft wet conditions might happen earlier. Um, in some parts of Alberta they're actually expecting more moisture, more precipitation, but also more heat. So um, it might be that our net moisture will be less, um, but its timing is going to be different. So I think the sensitive periods might be shifting. I mean, you know, long term, like not tomorrow or anything like that. But so definitely it might be something we need to start thinking about um, if snowmelt patterns and runoff, spring runoff patterns change, looking at um, when suitable or, you know, when's riskier will change. Oops, are you still muted, Tracy? Great. Thanks. Can't hear me? <laughs> yeah, you're good now. Um, we're, we're just going to wrap things up and we can continue on afterwards if people would like. But just a reminder, an email will be sent out with links to the first four sessions and a survey will also be sent out. Uh, these surveys really help us plan for future events. So if you can take a minute to fill it out, that would be great. And just wanted to say thank you to our sponsors again, and thanks to everyone for taking the time out to join us today. Uh, our next webinar is July 23rd, and it's Ross Adams and Donna Lawrence will be talking about range health assessment, and we hope to see you there. And so for anyone who would like to, we can stay on the line and remember to use the participant icon to raise your hand for this portion of the questions. And again, a thanks to our sponsors.
Okay. Yeah, so stay on the line if you want to continue with Q&A. We, um, we're happy to take more. All right. I'm just going to check if we have anyone's hand up. I don't believe so. So for Q&A, for the water hemlock, we have a new pastor that has a fair bit. We have been picking it to help reduce it. Any other way to control it? Sample mowing. Yeah, I, I don't think so. Um, I, 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 I have not heard of all the years that we've worked with producers. I think that's your only option. Um, if you're really concerned about it is, is sort of picking it. Um, and uh, your question does picking help. I'm not sure. Like maybe the, if you're doing a lot of picking, it's encouraging it. I don't, I don't think there's any science on it. That's, it's one of those things that it's just kind of anecdotal um, that we know. I, I would say if you have a lot of it, you know, might be, an, it, it likes a very specific kind of moisture regime and soil conditions. You, you might want to put some electric fence around that or just uh, like it's, if, if you have a huge area of it, uh, it's a real challenge obviously to deal with it. I'm not sure um, picking it is a long-term solution. Um, you know, maybe, maybe it's a, a, yeah, so you'd say we do, you do fence it. So that's a good option, I think, um, if there's a lot of it, because you can't, obviously can't handpick it. <laughs> it is a native species, but it's also a risk to your livestock, obviously. So, um, you know, fencing it out might be the option if you have a lot and it, you know, picking a bit here and there isn't the solution. And so the related question to that is, you know, is it poisonous to touch? Yes, it is poisonous to touch. So if you are picking it, you need to be careful. Certainly don't be putting your hands in your mouth. Uh, use gloves or wash, you know, really wash your hands well, obviously, um, because it is all, all parts of the plant are poisonous and um, quite poisonous. So make sure you're um, not, you know, licking your fingers and having lunch later with those same hands. Um, so yeah, gloves and garbage bags um, is the response to that. So. <laughs> yeah. Great. All right. Okay. I think. Do you want me that... to answer that last question there, Tracy? Oh, yep. Did I miss one? You go ahead. So the question is um, how, in other ways, can we make grasslands more economic besides agricultural related activities? I think that's a great question, actually. You know, agricultural products, whether it's beef from cows or uh, the, the crops we produce on land, have a limited amount that we can take off the landscape and, and continue to have them healthy. I think some of the other um, goods and services, the water quality, the wildlife, the recreational opportunities, um, those are things that in a healthy landscape are also being produced. Um, there's of course more and more emphasis on ecological goods and services. Um, and I, I, you know, the term monetizing them, like adding value to them, but maybe rewarding producers for them. Whereas producers have those opportunities in some parts of the world they do, um, you know, they have bed and breakfast and allow walking paths through their pastures. They have uh, not in Alberta, it's not allowed in most of Canada, it's not, but hunting rights that can be sold or um, you know opportunities for people to invest in in your land in a way that's different than just say the beef or, or the sheep or the or the goats whatever you're grazing off of the land um, I think there's opportunities for people to add value and invest in you know good stewardship for other things because they because they want water quality downstream they want flood protection and drought proofing that the that a healthy landscape provides the the overall community um, I think um, I think those are all opportunities I think it takes a very different kind of uh, thinking than primary produ agricultural producers are used to um, but more and more I think agricultural producers are going to direct marketing and um, sales of their beef products I think it's an opportunity to reach out to consumers and their community for them to be part of sort of the whole not just sort of the, the beef they might eat or the you know the, the mutton or the the, the lamb and uh, actually look at opportunities for engaging community support in addition to the bigger picture of sort of policy considerations like ecological goods and services payments that are sort of the larger scale either through nonprofits or through government grants or government systems i think i think producers um you know can really add value the, the canadian roundtable for sustainable beef um 
has proven that um, there is a market on the beef side of things for um, there, there's a premium by doing those extra things um, by getting cert certified sustainable um, the beef is more valuable at the packing plant which is then more valuable at the retail or, or the fast food place like McDonald's or Loblaws or um, so so I think there's there there is there is the sort of bigger picture but also the local what you can do as an individual producer that that I think are opportunities so there's a couple more questions sir Tracy you're muted again <laughs> sorry Noreen so good. <laughs> can you get too much vegetation in a riparian area yeah, um, I would say sometimes, um, you know, we often hear that resting a site too long becomes a fire hazard. I would say that's a pretty low risk in most riparian areas because they're just a wetter place. Um, and you look at forest fires, um, riparian areas are often the places that don't burn because in, in natural ecosystems and ungrazed systems, because, um, because they have that extra moisture, they're just wetter. So they're not as likely to burn or, or they burn very less amounts and patches or less severely. Um, certainly you can have um, a lot of litter buildup and I would say the bigger more typical issue in riparian areas is where it's dominated by non-native grasses like brome, timothy. Um, they produce a lot of forage and if they aren't grazed they can actually become opportunities for lots of weeds and we've seen that in some long-term rest situations where there's exclusion fencing, keeping the cows out of the, the near stream area. And if you have a lot of brome or reed canary grass as well, you can, you can create a lot of litter. And then you actually um, choke out the opportunity for some of the willows to come back if, they, if you were trying to get that recovery. Sometimes it's hard for them to battle, compete. Um, and then you also can, we've seen it like where Canada thistle starts to be an issue because there's so much litter, it just gets established in the litter. Um, but riparian areas, depending on the site, are also subject to a lot more disturbance than other places, you know, whether it's floods um, and, and inundation of water or burial, so lots of sediment covering everything. So they can, they can go from too much uh, let's say, or a lot of litter and a lot of forage production to zero in another year. Unlike an upland, um, unless there's a fire, of course, um, you can have a lot of production, but it might be underwater one year, or it might be buried with sediment deposition. And we certainly see that um, at times as well. So generally, I don't, you know, it's not that common that you need to worry about too much. Uh, I'm not saying never, more, I would say that's more of a weed management issue than a, say, a hazard or other problem issue. Um, and certainly if you're trying to recover a site because it's missing some element, you want to think about that aspect of it. All right, we had one more come in. Is grassland grazing more nutritive and healthy in respect to calcium absorption in body and milk to domestic cattle and animals instead of artificial feed or fodder? Not, I'm not, I'm not sure if you can take this. Right yeah, now, but. the short answer is I'm not sure. From a, from a, certainly from a dairy cow perspective, um, I would say that beef cows certainly, you know, there's more than you know, adequate nutrition in lots of are not either tame or native forages, generally speaking. But I mean, most most livestock producers are providing mineral supplement or salt supplements, regardless. Um, in terms of milk and calcium absorption, I'm going to guess that dairy cows have such high high needs. That's why they have vet determined amounts that they need help and lots of supplements with. But I I don't really know. Noreen and Tracy, we have a, a hands up in the attendees there. I'll uh, just let Okay, great. Sorry, I'm just trying to get to my list. It looks like it's Olivia. Is that right, Jonathan? That's the one you're seeing? Yep, that's correct. Go ahead, Olivia. I'm just, we're unmuting you, so you should, you just have to respond that you want us to unmute you. Go ahead. Oop. 
we hover? It's not showing up on my end. It disappeared for some reason. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened there. Um, sorry, yeah. Olivia, sign back in if you can. <laughs> um, it looks like Amy has also asked, has, is that right? Did I see a hand raised? It disappeared on me as well. Yeah, just for mind, I'm not seeing the hands raised, I guess. So you guys see something, go ahead. If you aren't able and we're not able to let you talk, um, please do type a comment in if you can. If you type it in your chat box, if you can to us or in the Q&A, if you're able to do that, obviously, if we can't make the voice work. There is one more question in the question and answer. Mm -hmm. How many um, uh, and how many ways does pasture play a role in vital role in top topography and demography for a country? Um, I mean, I'll, I'll answer that from a sort of a systems wide perspective. I, I, obviously, agriculture and grazing in particular is really critical to healthy landscapes. It's a huge portion of um, our landscapes um, in Alberta and many, many other countries. Um, grazing is part of what helps us not only have food to eat from a beef perspective or, or other grazed animals, but it is what maintains those ecological goods and services by you know, having na native landscapes. So it supports economies, it supports rural communities that in some places, certainly in North America, are dwindling as, you know, a fewer and fewer people are in rural and agricultural landscapes. So certainly pasture management and grazing management is an important part of it from a, that sort of community level and larger societal level. Um, and, you know, again, having perennial cover is important, not only for the functions I talked about, but things like stability and drought and flood situations and resiliency um, through, through dry periods or, or, or overly wet periods, obviously, as well, with, with, let, with limited inputs, um, you know, because they can be self-sustaining if they're well managed, they don't need to be cultivated, they don't need to be fertilized compared to other agricultural pursuits. But they're generally also, they don't make as many dollars um, as some other kinds of land uses might. Um, and that has to be balanced off with what we put into them, obviously, because at least in Alberta, agricultural land is not typically valued at agricultural prices, it's valued at something more than agricul regular agricultural primary production can produce off of it. All right, well, I think that's it for today. Thanks everybody for attending and thanks Noreen for the great presentation. And hopefully we will see everyone on Thursday. Great, thanks. Thank All you right. everybody. Thanks. Bye.